Um, really happy that people could join today. I, I, I thought it'd be useful for us to spend a few minutes uh, together because so much is going on right now with COVID. And I feel like we're at a really important moment in the, in the arc of this pandemic uh, where we really are starting to shift in my mind towards uh, what really should be uh, much better days ahead with still some bumps, still some challenges ahead of us. And, and I want to um, take a couple of minutes to talk specifically about what has happened over the last week with vaccines for kids 5 to 11, um, what the evidence is, why I think both the FDA advisory committee and the CDC advisory committee voted unanimously. I know there's one abstention on the FDA advisory committee side, but if you look across those, uh, there were 31 votes in favor and one abstention, uh, really because the evidence here is really very clear that kids five through 11 benefit from the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I've laid out some of the arguments for why I think the advisory committee voted the way they did in a Time Magazine piece I wrote over the weekend. But I just wanna take a minute to highlight uh, that you know, despite all the misinformation that we often hear about kids are not at risk, um, the real issue is if you compare the risk of COVID compared to other risks that children face, this is a serious problem. And it is a problem for which we now have a highly effective very safe preventive measure, and that is a vaccine. And uh, and therefore, uh, in my mind, it really is not a close clinical call. I think every child in America, five to 11, should get, get vaccinated. I think every child 12 through 17 should get vaccinated. Uh, the evidence on all of this is very clear. Um, the couple of issues that I wanna just quickly address on five to 11, uh, really the biggest one that has concerned people is the issue of myocarditis. Uh, myocarditis is, a, is a, a reaction that we see in about one in 10,000 uh, children between the ages of 12 and, and 15. Uh, that's been the kind of best estimate that we have. All of the data suggests that those are relatively mild, uh, certainly compared to myocarditis that you get from infections. It's, a, it's different mechanism wise uh, and it is self-resolving. And every bit of what we know about vaccine-induced myocarditis should make us feel like the rates are going to be much lower in five to 11-year-olds. We don't know. The clinical trials didn't identify anybody. And that's not a surprise, of course, because uh, the clinical trials only had about 2,200 kids who got the, the Pfizer vaccine. But it's a lower dose. It's in prepubescent boys. We think boys are much more at, at risk. And so even if the risk was as high as it is for 12 to 15 year olds, you, you'd still be worth it. But I think most of us should feel very confident that the risk of myocarditis is gonna be much, much lower in this population. Combine that with all of the other safety benefits, the clear efficacy of 90%. And it is no surprise that both the Adv FDA advisory committee and the CDC advisory committee uh, voted unanimously in favor. And then of course, Dr. Walensky signed the CDC um, authorization and the vaccines are now getting out. Um, my expectation is the next few weeks, it's gonna be hard to get vaccines because there's a lot of pent up demand, about 30, 35% of American parents, including me, uh, are very excited to get their kids five to 11 vaccinated. Uh, that's you know probably about nine, 10 million children. And it's gonna take a while to just get all those kids uh, their first shot. And then, it's gonna, then the hard work is gonna begin of uh, pediatricians, family practitioners, uh, nurse practitioners really having those conversations with parents, uh, with families about the value of vaccinations. I remain confident that we're going to see reasonably high vaccination rates in this population, but it's going to take a little while and certainly will take a few weeks or even a few months before we get uh, into high levels of, of vaccinations for this population. Let's talk a little bit about what the implications of all of this are, and then I want to just also take two minutes to talk about kind of what's happening nationally beyond children. As these vaccines begin to get out, um, it will, I think, have a really important impact on schools. Now, schools have largely been open. That's terrific. We still continue to have too much quarantining and, and kids getting pulled out of school because of, uh, of infections. I think that's a problem. At this point, we have all the tools necessary that we don't have to pull kids who've been exposed out of school. We can let them continue to be in school using methods like test and stay. But then once you add vaccination in for all school age children, it becomes a very different situation uh, where between adults being vaccinated, kids having the opportunity to be vaccinated, uh, at some point, I think we can begin to think about pulling back on some of the other restrictions we have. Uh, obviously, the one that's the most uh, contentious is mask mandates. 
And I believe that once vaccines are widely available over the next couple of months, um, being able to pull back on the mandates for masks would be is going to be very, very reasonable. Um, kids can continue to still mask if they're in high risk groups. Uh, the availability of high quality masks means that people can protect themselves quite effectively. Uh, and, and I suspect that certainly masking during uh, times when people have symptoms, uh, maybe when there might be a, a large local outbreak it would all be reasonable. But I think in general, the mask mandates that we have seen across the country uh, will begin to get pulled back. And I think it'd be reasonable to do so. Um, but but the bigger picture point is with large scale vaccination of kids, we really can get back to what I think is a new normal, a relatively you know good normal where sports, activities, all the things that are so important beyond just being in the classroom uh, should really resume in a, in a way that uh, looks a lot more like 2019 than it does what, what life looked like in 2020 or even early parts of 2021. So that's good news. And I think that is uh, coming sooner rather than later. Let me just take a minute to talk about where we are as a country. The good news uh, has been that the Delta uh, wave really did peak at the end of August, uh, early September, and has had a nice steady decline down, peaking at about 150 to 160,000 infections. It has come down at, uh, to about 70,000. And then over the last week, really for the first time since that decline began, uh, we've seen a real plateauing. Uh, we've, the infection numbers have been about 70, 75,000, seven day moving average uh, over the last seven, eight days. And it is possible that it is just a pause before it declines further. Uh, I suspect it may not be. I suspect that we may be plateauing at a reasonably high level, or we could even see infection numbers start climbing back up again. What do I think is going on? Um, what's going on is the weather. Um, in the northern half of the country, it's getting pretty chilly. Uh, here in New England, it's, you know, it was in the 30s when I woke up this morning. And this is what we expect in early November. And obviously, it is only going to get colder. And we also know by the seasonality of coronaviruses generally, not just SARS-CoV-2, but other coronaviruses, that they really take off in October, November, December. Those are the most active months for human coronaviruses. And so I think what you have is seasonality, weather, people spending more time indoors, running up against highly vaccinated populations. So whereas last year between October and November, we saw this huge acceleration of infections. I don't think that's what's going to happen. We are going to see a plateauing. And the last point is I think we're going to see a split. Um, in New England, where I am, it's the states are very, very highly vaccinated with 70% uh, of the population uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, you're going to see more vaccinations coming online as kids get more vaccinated. I think New England is going to stay relatively flat or might even decline further despite the weather. Um, in the Great uh, Plains states in the upper Midwest, where vaccination rates are lower, I both already case numbers are higher and I expect more concerns in terms of what's going to happen in the next couple of months. Uh, again, I don't think we're going to repeat the performance of the fall and winter of 2020 uh, just because there's so much more uh, immunity in the population. But I worry that there are states in the U.S. that still are, are not out of the woods and may face some difficult uh, months ahead. And then finally, just to finish off, I'm going to take a moment, uh, just talk about the global scene. Uh, global vaccinations are continuing. Uh, China has, has vaccinated, has administered about 2.2 billion doses. India hit the 1 billion mark recently. Uh, much of the world is kind of cooking along. The big problem of global vaccination remains Africa, uh, which has less than 5% of its population fully vaccinated, about 7 8% with at least one dose. And we have all got to do a lot more across the world, from high-income countries like the U.S. and Europe to India, which is now starting to get to a point where it's starting to have more vaccines than, than people certainly will in the, in the next month or two, uh, that we've got to get a lot more vaccines to the African continent and make sure that we've at least vaccinated all the high-risk people and ideally uh, the entire population. I'm optimistic about global vaccinations in 2022, but we still have work to do, especially on the continent of Africa, but some other uh, lower-income countries as well.